Okay. okay. Okay, Harika, I think we can start. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's uh, proceed to the last academic session of the conference. Uh, in this uh, session, uh, we are going to be discussing the challenges in recovering from major educational uh, dispute. Uh, this uh, session will be chaired by Jam, and we are having three amazing panel uh, panelists. Uh, Maya Sarin, uh, Atma Raman, and uh, Ranjini, ma'am. Over to you, Jack. Welcome, everyone, to this uh, panel discussion. Uh, as we all have been talking about the last uh, three days, the pandemic has made a, a major difference in the lives of uh, teachers and children. And uh, we saw many strategies that teachers used to used to cope during the pandemic we had discussions on uh, online education problems related to that uh, pedagogic issues uh, mental health issues interaction between teachers and students so many things have been talked about now schools are reopening now and uh, in many many states uh, classes have resumed for uh, I mean, schools have resumed for classes 9 to 12. For uh, younger children, some states have started, but in general, uh, schools have not reopened. But uh, the question, big question is, when schools resume, what happens, right? Uh, for me, it was uh, uh, brought home quite dramatically when a child who, who I was asking, what class are you in? He said five and then said, no, six. He said uh, uh, six. He thought a little and said six because uh, you know he hasn't had any classes, uh, so-called class five. No, for a small child like that, it's a big hole in his life, right? And uh, now, if classes start, he was not sure whether uh, he will go to class six. Okay. So then, people around we were talking, and they said, no, 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 you are in class six. He said, but what about class five? So when school opens, will he be looking at class five books or class six books? Or he was worried that he would be deprived of the new books. That is one concern. For a small child, that's always a worry. And the other worry was that uh, well, he, one very important thing is that he got class five books last year. And he was terrified that I would be assuming that he has actually you know, mastered class five books. Right? <laughs> Nobody said anything to children, did anyone? So, uh, so what happens when classes resume? And mathematics has this, uh, you know, tall, uh, tower-shaped uh, curriculum where one thing builds on another, one thing builds on another, and at every point of time, um, the school system or the college system, you know, it's all the way across that there are expectations, <laughs> and you are expected to come after storm or rain or whatever, and just get on with your uh, dy dx or whichever it is you're supposed to be doing so uh, in the teaching community there has been a uh, lot of apprehension about this uh, discussions about this in some fora so what we thought was that uh, in our conference we would have uh, initiate some discussion on this that we can probably take forward so we have uh, three panelists with us uh, Sri Ranjani Ranganathan, Atmaraman, and Maya Sara. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, the panelists and all of you to this discussion. Uh, Ranjani has uh, more than two decades of experience uh, working with uh, different aspects of school education. And she has worked with small children, she has worked with teenagers, she has worked with teachers uh, on teacher professional development. And uh, so she brings in a range of experiences and uh, she'll be starting the discussion with some observations uh, from the elementary school stage. Uh, I will introduce each panelist as, got it. Uh, I'll introduce each panelist as we go along. And uh, the structure is that each panelist roughly gets about uh, 10 minutes to make a short presentation. And then after the panel presentations are over, we have 
panel is responding to each other and then uh, we open it up for general discussion. So let me start with requesting Ranjani to open the discussion. Thank you, Jam. And uh, good afternoon to my fellow panelists and all the other participants in the conference. And a happy Teacher's Day to all of you. Um, so, yeah, this is, uh, we, all of us have been talking about what happens when um, school reopens and I've tried to put together some thoughts based on uh, my experiences working both with children and also to some extent with teachers in the, in the last year of um, this lockdown and school closures. So broadly, I've thought of, you know, I've structured my this short presentation in terms of what can we take as given, what do we what do we know going in, or what can we make a safe assumption about? And what are the, some of the things that we would need to do, look at? And more importantly, what do we really need to push for, advocate for, for changes in the education system that need to come in um, for us to actually respond to this uh, meaningfully? So what can we take as given? Um, first thing I really want to say is children have been learning. I think. Um, they have been living for these last 16, 17 months. We've asked them to live in some very unnatural circumstances, very, very unnatural from a child's point of view, a five-year-old, seven-year-old, 13-year-old, 16-year-old. They all have different challenges of being cooped up in the same space as adults. And they've been coping to various uh, degrees. Some, in, uh, many, in fact, in very, very uh, uh, impoverished conditions coping. So I think we should first understand that children have learned something and not treat them as some kind of completely deprived. So that's one. And also the question of this learning loss to be deconstructed a little bit in terms of skills that have been forgotten, which they have learned earlier, but because they didn't have an opportunity to use, have been forgotten. Skills whose acquisition has been delayed because they just didn't have that kind of input yet. Similarly, content that's been forgotten and content that's not yet been learned. And also, we need to distinguish that real loss from, you know, our perhaps a sense of notional loss of what they might have been acquiring or would have acquired but not yet acquired, I think, is a very notional construct. And we need to really distinguish that. The other thing that we need to also look at is in terms of uh, teachers' readiness. And I think this is one of the questions in one of the panels yesterday. I I don't remember who raised it, but uh, how teacher, how ready are the teachers? You know, professionally, how ready are they to meet the children now? Even personally, I think we don't really talk about um, what teachers, especially women teachers, would have undergone this last one year, and how ready are they to actually meet the children when school reopens? We are not meeting the same children that we left off with last February, and uh, perhaps definitely not the class we met on Google Meet last month because the children who we meet on Google Classroom, we don't even meet, and we don't know who they are. And when we meet them, especially for young children, when they meet them, we are perhaps, we have to reacquaint ourselves with each other. And the school reopening is very different in some ways, and perhaps uh, not so different in some other ways. I'll first talk about how I think it may be different, is that we're likely to see more variation in the class than we perhaps I'd seen earlier in any class. And uh, we all know that there has always been a variation in, in the class. Children are not at the same level, however much we would have liked to see them in one single age bracket. Uh, teaching to the mean now will reach even lesser students. Even earlier, it was not reaching all. Now it is likely to reach even lesser. And depending upon the context of each one of us where we teach, the children's readiness to engage with formal learning will vary. And in, in particularly the context that I'm talking about, which is the young children, their ability to actually listen to instructions, follow through on an instruction, complete an activity. None of these children have really had any sustained interaction input. And in some senses, these very important skills of learning to learn have, uh, have not been reinforced and perhaps will need to be uh, reinforced to the children all over again. And where it's likely not different is that variations always existed. The context always determined how each child learned. And uh, we always needed an individualized learning path, but we were never able to make that happen within the structures of the school education. So in terms of um, strategies, um, I, was, I was just thinking, OK, what do we now really do? And then 
So the first thing first I really want to say is we do not need to work backwards. I think that's one thing that I really want to perhaps think that we don't need to think of where they need to be in class eight or nine and then sort of work backwards. In some senses, this is unprecedented, but studies of some other educational intervention uh, disruptions that I was just reading up and I mean, I, I some fe see, feel that it's perhaps not as much of a catastrophe that you know will doom children for life. And I'm just apprehensive that what the pandemic did not do in terms of disruption, our interventions of restoring education should not do. That's kind of what I'm a little apprehensive about. Children can recover from stress, but we need to understand what their stresses are and respond to those stresses appropriately. And I'm talking primarily from the point of view of young children right now. We need to meet the children where they are. It's not about the lesson plans that we left them with last year. And, uh, and the, in the case of uh, students where there has been continuing instruction of some kind through various medium. Uh, yeah, there is a certain continuity that we can assume, but we would need to take it very, very, very tentatively. Um, I know, for instance, that uh, where I worked with government school children um, in class eight, there were only 15 to 20 percent of students who at any point of time could attend the classes. So we can pretty much assume that there was no instruction, even in places where there have been online instructions. And even in more resource settings of children, um, how much they really learned, what they learned um, is, is to be understood. And in schools like ours, I come from the KFI um, tribal schools, where the schools did not really close at all. We actually ran the schools the whole of last year through one-on-one um, -on -one small group meetings with uh, between teachers and children. Even in these schools, we found that children's ability to complete written work independently dropped significantly, even though the teachers were in touch with them. And that's because the space for them to do that independent work was not a mentored space and their home was not conducive to doing it. So even in cases where there was a hand holding near continuously, there was a gap um, in terms of children's ability to complete written work. So then what do we do? We, we first now need to know where children are, but not work backwards from the content that they are supposed to know. It's you know, class five becoming class six, becoming class seven, but rather actually said, you know, observe them and see what children bring to the class. What is it that they remember? What is it that they understand? What is it that they're able to solve? And what problems are they actually able to work with? And it is possible to do by actually structuring assessments more focused on doing than on writing. And it's quite possible. I wouldn't obviously venture to discuss those details here. I'm sure many of you are aware of most of these things. And where possible, the classes should be reorganized to allow for um, mixed level learning, where children can also create their own sequences of learning. These have been tried. There have been very many models of these things. And it's time to sort of bring these things into the formal school space as well. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, one of the, and also relate their math learning to real learning. In fact, one of my uh, best memory of word problem giving to children is when I was working with an eight-year-old and I was giving him some word problem for subtraction. And me and my colleague were working and it was some simple problem that you have so many eggs and you give someone so many to somebody. The child's immediate response was, why will I give the eggs? I won't give the eggs. So it was not a matter of giving a subtraction problem. But I think we have to really focus the math more in terms of what is it that children have to do? What is it that excites them to do? And the math follows that investigation instead of us trying to fit a real world example to a math problem that we want to teach. And I'm sure this distinction is known to all of you as well. In terms of resources, we really need to uh, work with teachers on um, lesson ideas and projects that are not textbook driven that are not going by the sequence that's already laid out in the textbook and the teachers have to just follow through and definitely not work towards a level that they have to achieve in a particular class. And uh, the orientation for the teachers is also important in the direction of uh, watching out for psychological distress in children. Um, one of the things that I have uh, noticed in some cases where I've had an opportunity to interact with some children is that in a classroom, when children are with each other, they learn from each other. And when children are a little slower than others, it doesn't get so often noticed. It doesn't get so often called out. This became very acutely called out in the in a Zoom setting or a, you know, an online setting because the children didn't have that same access to other children's work and learning from others. And this is likely to be more visible in children when they actually come back to school 
this year because it's a double whammy. First of all, they've lost its uh, skill of interaction itself. And because of that loss of interaction, they may have actually not been able to learn things the way they have always been able to learn. So teachers really need to be supported um, in that as well. And for children, we need to really think of access um, to learning materials at multiple levels. To, to sum up and to conclude, what I really want to say is, I don't think we need to treat this um, as an end of the world kind of a, a thing and respond with uh, emergency measures and accelerated learning and all of that. But we do need to bring in more flexible models of mathematics instruction, at least up to the elementary level, and not have some tokenistic reductions of syllabus and working backwards. That is, that is unlikely to help at all. And um, teacher autonomy is critical. Teachers are pretty much have never had a voice in saying how classrooms should be designed or how they should take their lessons. But I think it's really, really important that we bring that back into the center of the discourse right now. And the centralized nature of education is what led to this scale of disruption in a large um, society country like ours. And that should not further impact the, you know, the building back of the learning as well. And I also think one thing I really want to say is that um, the equity considerations in education have been non-existent and some standard curriculum based on some kind of compulsions that we have about meeting, uh, you know, some kind of aspirations have determined the learning paths for all the children. And that it's time to really advocate and you know, call for a stop to that. And lastly, I really also want to say that we should contest the different kinds of online platforms and models of learning that, has been, that are being thrown about. And some have gone to the extent of saying your child can learn even without the teacher very well. So I think we really need to sort of use this opportunity to also contest these things. So I think I, I'll stop with this and maybe perhaps take up uh, in a second round of discussions when after I listen to other panelists as well. So Jan? Back to you. Thank you. Um, I hope I not exceeded you. the time. No, it's so. perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Manjini, for uh, uh, setting the stage for uh, much of the discussion that uh, we need to have. Uh, let me move to Mr. Aparaman. Um, I think he's known from to the Mass Teachers Association from the first conference itself. Uh, he's an eminent uh, educator a teacher with uh, half a century of uh, math education experience in Tamil Nadu. Uh, I mean, uh, somebody whom I regard very highly. I think a uh, uh, couple of generations of uh, math learners in Tamil Nadu would attest to that. He's uh, uh, one of the leading lights of the Association of Math Teachers of India and uh, has done uh, human service and uh, not only working with children, working with teachers, working with schools, guiding them to, to uh, various aspects of uh, uh, mathematics education at the school level, especially non-routine problem solving, which uh, open-ended problem solving. Many of these things that uh, people have really no clue about, Aparaman sir has been one of the leading lights, uh, getting teachers to think about these, work with them for a long time. It's a pleasure to have him here, and uh, we would like to hear his views on this. Uh, perhaps uh, with some emphasis on the secondary stage. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tam, for all the compliments. Um, see, this uh, uh, panel discussion, I think, um, arose because of one fundamental question, namely, what is the idea of uh, opening the schools uh, I mean, so much of risk. Why should we be open at all? What's the fun? We have some answers based on which we have to think about the mathematics at the secondary level. First one is completion of course, facilitation to complete the course that we have to do. That is the responsibility. So, if for that, what is happening? We have already taught something online. And now we aim to do a few more things, new things in the next level. How are we going to do it? Are we going to add on online or in person or both? 
So this is the fundamental question which we have to consider, which will help us at the secondary level. The second one is the social and psychological well-being of children. See, in the mathematics class, there is a lot of scope for children to interact among themselves and also with the teacher. And that leads to a lot of learning, self-learning also. So should we not have classes open all the time? Why should we have online at all? So that is another question which comes to our mind. The third is reducing dropouts. That is a very big problem. The children, they have not seen the school for about a couple of years. And some, some children have gone for work for economic support. And some children have lost interest in studies itself. So how are we going to compensate this with our tactics, our techniques? with our technology or with our teaching methods. So that is that is what we have to think. So this raises uh, so many other uh, things. First of all, there are other reasons also. There are other reasons, for example, uh, uh, many children, millions of children, in, in fact, depend upon school for their midday meals. So they come to school for taking lunch and then pursuing studies. So now if the schools are closed, what will happen? So that is the problem. So now, uh, what we have to do is how to manage our system keeping all these things in, in our mind and at the same time not sacrificing anything in our uh, effort for giving good mathematics, essential mathematics to children. That is, that is the problem now. Now, there is another uh, uh, thing which we have to consider. See, there is, uh, if, if, it is, if the schools have to adopt a certain um, norms, for example, one seat, one student norm, is it not? But do you think it will help in a mathematics class? Mathematics class is, I mean, is, is lively only when there is interaction and when there is a cooperative learning. That will be missing if the schools are closed. So at least for that, we have to keep the schools open. That is uh, one, one, which, one thing which we have to remember. We have to keep children very safe and happy also, that is. Now, one idea which comes to my mind is curriculum pruning. That is, our curriculum developers are over ambitious in general. That is my opinion. I have also been in um, a few curricular uh, development uh, things, but I feel that this uh, overambitious curriculum sometimes harms the children. And that, and that is one of the reasons I believe for children losing the interest in mathematics. So how to, how to do this? If you, for example, if you take in Tamil Nadu, at least I know, if you take uh, in 10th standard, there is a chapter on matrices. Now, up to 10th standard, our idea, our idea is to give basic mathematics for life. So I don't know how we are going, how the child is going to use matrices in everyday life. 
So should we have these extra things? Is it necessary? We have to consider. So perhaps we may remove a few portions from the curricula which are not very much needed immediately. After a couple of years, perhaps, when the, system, when the whole thing becomes normal, we can think of enriching the curriculum. But at present, in the present circumstances, we have to fill up the gap. And at the same time, we have to make things happy and light. So for at least keeping this in mind, we have to remove a few portions from the present curricula so that we can have, uh, we can complete the portions in time. We can give sufficient uh, training in solving problems because the time is very short now. So for that purpose, at least we have to cut off certain portions in curricula. There are many things. We will, one of them I have pointed out. Now, then secondly, we should not teach unnecessary mathematics. Sometimes we concentrate more on skills than on concepts. And in teaching skills, we leave out the essential outcomes. And if you go to the, I, in fact, I interacted with certain teachers. So your teacher was uh, handling ratio in her class. I asked her, what is the outcome you expect after you teach this particular chapter? She is not able to tell. So we do not know what we expect from the children. And if, you, if, the, if the outcomes are unnecessary, we, can, we may not take them. So we have to list some essential outcomes out of all the outcomes that are possible so that things can be made light. And this is only for a shorter period. I don't mean it, it is it's a permanent arrangement. It's a temporary arrangement till we cross over this crisis. So we can, we can do that. And then teachers, our teachers are not well prepared to face this situation. They do not know what to do. In fact, they are quite confused. If you go and meet teachers in schools, they are confused. They do not know. They want to prepare the children for examination. They want to see the children score ranks. And at the same time, they want to teach all mathematics that is in the textbook. So if with, with this confused mind, I think a teacher cannot do full justice to the profession. So if you want, really the teachers should handle the situation successfully, you have to give some orientation, which is very important for teachers. So orientation teacher to teachers is more important at this stage, at least for a shorter period, as to how to uh, handle the situation. And that will certainly help uh, the teachers. For example, the teachers do not, where the teacher may not know that if you take a, a theorem, or, for example, there are several ways of proving the theorem formal proof, logical, or visual proof, or proof without words, as uh, uh, Dr. Nelson has done in his uh, exercise. So, all these are there. So, suppose the child chooses one of them or the teacher chooses one of them and gives them, is it sufficient? The teacher does not know. I told one particular school that it is not necessary that all the theorems should be given logically. You can also use visual proofs. They may not be strict, I mean proof in the strict sense, but they are certainly giving the complete idea of what is about the theorem. So, should we do that or not? So, we should uh, uh, give the good idea to teachers regarding this. And then, pedagogy, what method should I adopt? Should I um, 
go on uh, giving problem solving or can i am as the children as i used to do earlier uh, see, see some of them uh, in, in the earlier cases some of them will be left as projects some of them will be given as homework and then uh, it, it will not be done in the school at all so at secondary level how how shall we do how shall we do? what sort of pedagogy should, should be adopted should i use uh, uh, teaching it should i use the te technology what should i do so the teacher should be guided properly for this particular topic for this particular method is sufficient for the present so that is one thing that is, that is very important even in technology see not not all are well trained not all are well trained that's a problem if you take by me for example see i i see the digital use is very difficult for me because at this age but for youngsters it may not be so for youngsters it may not be so but they have a, which type of pedagogy should they use Raman, hmm. uh, maybe another couple of minutes we can conclude this and come back to the discussion. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry to interrupt. Okay. And um, you, you and, uh, improving the digital skills of the teachers may you have to train them because. without that it is not possible you have to do some portions only online some portions you can allot for uh, interaction in the class so for that the teachers have to be trained well i am sure that most teachers are not well trained in this and the online classes that are happening everywhere not not all are successful not all are successful so we have to find ways and means to see that uh the teachers are well trained in these programs and self study programs are also good for children i have tried this as a teacher uh, in 9 in 70s in tamil nadu there was only one english medium section per class and in my class there were about 97 children in one section so i what what could i do i say i suggest that a few portions to be studied by the students themselves i formed some groups for the in particular geometrical constructions were not done by me in the class the children struggled they went through the books they found the ways they solved and only when there was any doubt they came to me so in fact i found it very successful but i could not continue it for some other reason for the, i mean some local reasons of the school so i could not continue it but some some of the portions can be given for self study and i have full faith in our student community they can do it but we are not allowing them to do it that is so some some of the things and when previously there was a programmed instruction so some such material could be given to children and they they may be asked to learn some of the so that the burden of the syllabus can be uh, solved and then this assessment techniques which are very very important uh, i think the assessment that is done in schools are really very very disturbing the it is not just giving marks it is uh, actually see here is one question i for example See, there is a question. This is a multiple choice question, giving two marks to be solved in one minute, and that is in ninth standard. See, do you think that this is proper assessment? Is is it is it is it a proper question for that level for the, such a short time? See here, this is this is how things are being done. so in assessment and in framing question questions uh, the, the framing questions are very important but our teachers are very weak in that thing actually we have to judge a teacher only by their questions not by their answers so if the questions are properly given 
then I think the assessment will be proper. So we have to train the children and train the teachers in proper assessment techniques and means. In fact, in some of the countries I have seen, even lesson plans are given, ready-made lesson plans are given to teachers and ready-made assessment sheets are given to teachers. But we are not doing it in our, in our system and we should help the teachers at this juncture with all such facilities. <coughs> and also, in, even in uh, treating such questions in the classroom, uh, for example, if you, if you see splitting how to, how to split a question into several questions, so such things are not, uh, I mean, taught to uh, teachers either, either in the training colleges or in the orientation courses. So remembering all these, what we have to do is, first of all, curriculum pruning, lessen the portion. Second thing, give good orientation to teachers. That is very, very important. Three, proper assessment techniques. That is, what, that is very, very important. And four, if you want to do all this, you cannot do it only in the classroom. You cannot escape from giving online coaching. You have to adopt that also because now technology is uh, I mean, helping us and we should try to have the maximum use of that. But most of the online classes are simply video uh, classrooms, that's all. They are not doing much in that. In online classes, it, it cannot be the same like the regular class. So the, the difference is not very clear to teachers and we should help teachers by giving them proper orientation. So this is what I feel that we, we should uh, do immediately, at least for this temporary period. And maybe after a couple of years, we can revise our strategies and also the curriculum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm sorry to have interrupted you, but I think it, uh, uh, these are extremely important issues and you have uh, uh, given a, a wide range of things that uh, we need to consider. Uh, there is a very lively discussion going on in chat. There are very important comments uh, coming up. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we will take up. And, I mean, these are very major issues. Of course, uh, nobody can solve some of these fundamental problems in uh, you know, a few hours of discussion, even if we had the time. But I think it's important to discuss these issues. And uh, I think one thing that since that thing is still on the screen, maybe as, a, as an association, we should resolve that uh, you know, questions like that are no. <laughs> I mean, a big no to those <laughs> questions is something that we can. OK, uh, let me now invite uh, Professor Maya Saran of Ashoka University uh, to participate in this panel. I, Maya is uh, a logician, um, does uh, very interesting, very abstract mathematics. And uh, on the other hand, she's also, I should say on the other hand, because it's usually considered uh, something that uh, students find up above the sky and uh, something that, but uh, she's passionately interested in undergraduate education, has been discussing this, been looking at uh, what foundation in mathematics really means at undergraduate level. I met her to contribute her thoughts to the panel. Thank you so much, Jan, for inviting me. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, I've been listening very carefully to the uh, previous two speakers, uh, Ranjani and Atma Raman. And uh, it struck me as they were speaking that I was going to say exactly the same things as them in some of the same words. So Ranjani spoke about the gap always having been there. And that's, uh, I mean, it's education and their people and they go from school to college. The same issues are there at both levels. It just plays out in a uh, different way. Um, she also said we should meet the children where they are and not, you know, work backwards. And uh, Atmaraman said <laughs> we should not teach unnecessary mathematics. 
and uh, he also said that self-study works. And between all these points, that's pretty much the theme of what I'm going to say. Uh, nonetheless, uh, let me say it. So I was invited to speak about uh, undergraduate education in particular. And uh, I think the most actually about the first year students, because I have found uh, over the course of uh, the last year and a half that the students having the hardest time are the ones who started college in their bedrooms. You know, you look forward to going to college so much, you go through this hell of class 12 and you want to like get out, be independent. And one and a half years later, you're still in your parents' house uh, with your laptop on. So I've actually had a pretty ringside view of all levels of education because uh, I have three children and uh, I've had one in junior school, one in middle school, one in uh, senior school. And of course, I teach undergraduates and some postgraduates as well. So uh, I also have access like right at my house to all kinds of approaches because I have one very conscientious child and she's always stressed out about everything and I'm trying to get her to do less and not finish the homework and go to bed. I have one child who has played video games for one and a half years and I have one child who uh, does care but manages to do everything at the last minute and just enough. Uh, so there are all kinds of things going on and people actually were always having different experiences. Uh, at the undergraduate level, we have uh, roughly just as an order of magnitude kind of thing, we have about one core first year undergraduate students in, in the country. And what have they enrolled in college for? Like, why do we go to college at all? I thought about this and I, mean, I think we go for three things. One is of course the education and the qualification, you learn some content. One is uh, it's where you become an adult, you transition from being a school kid to being a working adult. Uh, and the third and the most important thing is the relationships, especially once you're in, let's say your third year of college, you're a math student, you already have understood the basics of mathematics, how the game is played. And now you could actually learn, you know, I don't know, measure theory or differential equations from a course era course. This stuff has been around for hundreds of years. It's there. You can look at a good book. If you really want to learn it, you can. And there are some wonderful online resources. So go learn it. But you're in college for the relationships that you build with your faculty and with your peers. And as uh, both of you, both the previous speakers have pointed out, so much of that learning happens there. And, uh, you know, usually in class, you don't say, well, I didn't understand anything. But maybe after the class with your peers, you can say, I didn't understand anything. And then maybe you sort it out or you don't. But at least you're not alone in that experience. You have a chance and you have your seniors around you. You're not isolated. So uh, as far as, you know, quantifying the effects of uh, this online education phase and undergraduate education, I think it's pretty hard. I tried to do some reading. I'm not even sure how you would assess people online. Like what does assessment mean? How do you do it reasonably online? My eldest uh, who's in class 11 recently went to school. They're going once a week. And she said, she's in a French class. She told me, she said, the class went terribly because nobody could say anything in French if they didn't have Google Translate on the side or the screen in front of them. And, you know, when I'm teaching or, or doing an assessment, every one of my students is sitting in front of the entire Internet. So how am I going to assess them? I mean, of course, there are ways um, to do it. And... I think the most reliable way to do a proper assessment where people aren't looking things up is actually, it's not really online. It's pen and paper with the camera on. Uh, nonetheless, everything that I looked up, uh, even with faulty assessment, uh, pretty much universally, I looked up lots of things. Uh, I looked up a study done by UNESCO, the World Economic Forum. There's a survey done in India as well. 
There's the US Department of Education Office for Civil Rights. Um, there are a lot of newspaper articles. And of course, there's the experience of myself and my colleagues and all of you. And everybody talks about uh, widening gaps, deepening gaps. And uh, as Ranjini said, these gaps were actually always there, but they were never the first or among the first things that people talked about when they talked about, uh, you know, uh, the state of education. And at least in my experience, in, in my world, which is very much college education. So there's the gap that students have between themselves as they enter college. And then there's the gap that, you know, widens or persists, uh, whether it's on the basis of, uh, you know, economic situation or disability or membership in a minority group or lack of role models or there's so many, or, or sometimes language. Uh, if you're in an English medium uh, institution and you're in, which is a lot of institutions and you are struggling with the language, that's an extra obstacle for you. So, um, this is sort of an opportunity to examine this uh, gap and maybe to do something about it. And I mean, I'm very well aware that so much of like all our curricula are centralized, uh, hyper-centralized, right? I mean, it's not even at uh, the teacher level or the institutional level, it's at, the, at a university level or at a national level. Uh, that these curricula are being set. But I thought, well, I'm just going to say what I think should be the case anyway, because if all of us just say that, well, it's all set at the national level and we can't do anything, then why are we here and what are we really talking about? So uh, I think this point about uh, not teaching unnecessary mathematics applies very strongly to undergraduate mathematics education. Almost everyone doing a mathematics degree, for them, it's their terminal degree in mathematics. They are not going to grad school in mathematics. So honestly, it really doesn't matter if they don't learn, you know, advanced differential equations or go to the last part of the second course in algebra. It doesn't matter. What they can really get out of uh, an undergraduate degree, and I think this applies whether you... Uh, are headed to grad school or not, even for the ones who want to go on to do a master's in mathematics, it applies maybe double for them. What they really should get out of this time in college is the skills of a mathematician. And to get those skills, you have to do it yourself. Watching somebody write down the proof of a theorem on the board or on a Zoom screen is the most boring thing in the world. I have never understood a proof that anybody has ever written on a board. This is like the, I think, people don't say it. Watching somebody write stuff on a board is pretty much a waste of everybody's time. And you know, this business of covering syllabi, I'm just allergic to this word covering. What did you cover? You covered the board, that's what you covered. Nobody understood anything. <laughs> they probably zone out. And I uh, actually, I really struggled in uh, math in class 11 and 12, especially class 11, because it was so boring. And I failed math in class 11 and I passed into class 12 with grace marks because I was kind of, you know, not paying attention and I didn't. I had a vague feeling that is not so hard, but I really couldn't bring myself to do it. And there are so many students, like I look among my undergraduates, and probably many of them are perfectly capable. And if they applied themselves, could really like rock it. But it's too boring. <laughs> when it becomes not boring is when you give them a chance to do it yourself to do it themselves. So even if you just, you know, uh, sequences and series, for example, just, it's a beautiful topic. And if you get to roll up your sleeves and prove a few simple theorems really by yourself, what you get out of it is something pretty amazing. 
And I mean, there you have a chance to get from mathematics all that it has to offer an undergraduate, whether or not they do math later. I think of these, uh, like what you get from mathematics as sort of falling into two categories. One is the skills of analytical thinking, rigor in argumentation, writing down a pretty complex argument that someone else can actually read and make sense of. Uh, you know, how you write it down is also an important skill which students should get. I mean, it's worth spending time on. And the other thing is, you know, general problem solving kind of skills. For example, persistence. I mean, this uh, question uh, that Atma Raman put up, it totally stressed me out. And when he said, you have one minute, I was like, okay, there's no way. I just gave up right away. <laughs> You know, and like, what interesting problem in life is supposed to be done in one minute? Nothing. You know, I mean, so to get the experience of having a hard problem that's going to take a couple of weeks of thinking about, okay, not a couple of weeks, maybe a week, maybe three, four days, but it's not a one minute problem. This is a valuable experience. And mathematics is a beautiful field in which to give students this experience because it's completely self-contained. There's no context. There's no history that you need to know in order to make sense of this. You know, here are some assumptions and here are, here's the setup and now here's a statement and we're asking if it's true or not. And it's a yes, no question either. It's true or it's not. No, now you just have to think about it. And, uh, you know, I mean, I work pretty hard to make my students intellectually self-reliant. And I'm actually lucky because I get to do things. And there is a, a syllabus, but you know, I can choose my own textbook and like how I run the class. I'm a big fan of uh, inquiry-based learning and uh, I use it all the time in any class that I can use it in. And I, 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 I've seen what it done for students, even the weaker ones. And I happen to think that inquiry-based learning as students come back to education as they start college, perhaps having missed some things in school. Uh, it allows students to start where they are. You give students a bunch of things to think about. Some of them will just go through the whole thing. And some of them will just make a little progress on some things, but they will own that progress and they feel so good about it. It's not passive. And um, this inquiry based, when I say inquiry based learning, I basically mean some type of classroom structure where students do the work themselves. It's not lecture-based. There are many forms in which uh, inquiry-based learning can be done. It's a, it's becoming more mainstream. I think there are you know textbooks being published uh, based on this kind of approach. Um, but I think less is more. And I mean, in school education, I feel like trigonometric identities. I wish somebody would just like throw that away and do something else in that time. Who in life ever makes use of a trigonometric identity? Nobody. <laughs> you know, and okay, fine, there are some skills of logic that you develop while proving those, but you could develop those same skills doing some much more beautiful, interesting mathematics. Um, and the same way in college, I think uh, if we did less, then and got students to do more stuff themselves, it would allow, it would be part of meeting students where they are. Aya? Yes. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yes, okay. I, I've basically said what I had to say. Um, do less, <laughs> get students to do things themselves. And just, uh, you know, this is not just me speaking. This approach has been around for a while. And uh, usually, uh, People are resistant to doing things in a different way. So some pretty solid studies have been done with thousands of students across universities. If you do less, but allow students to do it themselves, uh, then the students who were getting A's anyway, the so-called strong students, aren't going to suffer, but more people will do well. So uh, in the end, it doesn't harm anybody and it benefits lots of people, especially women and minorities. I will stop there. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thanks. Uh, I thank all the panelists for uh, this uh,
important discussion and uh, many, many ideas have uh, come up. Now, there are several things that have come up in the discussion and uh, on the chat as well. So let me uh, pose a few and uh, I mean, uh, there will be more questions coming daily. Uh, one is uh, related to online and uh, digital technologies because, uh, you know, the country has seen in the last one and a half years a tremendous advocacy of online education and digital technologies. And with the advent of the national education policy, uh, it's almost started like a mantra. Uh, one part of it is that, okay, pandemic, you can't do anything else. So therefore online, but there is another part, which is so, and on chat also, there were some discussions on these things. Now, if when we resume, uh, there is going to be, uh, we talk about hybrid modes, blended modes, what have you. So what is going to be the role of uh, digital tools, online tools, and what will that mean to education? If not immediate, in the immediate future, in for the immediate future, as well as for the time to come. And uh, are we prepared in any way to look at these questions? So this is one I want to address to. Another that uh, came up uh, at times is about uh, who should do what? I mean, uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, discussions were like teachers should do this, classroom should do this, syllabus, curriculum. Uh, but really, uh, do we have uh, clear answers for uh, uh, who should do what? I mean, what things should be done at a national level, state level, uh, or at a school level or college, you know, university level? Colleges don't have very much autonomy. I mean, universities, a few universities have some autonomy, but in general, how much autonomy does it? So teachers autonomy is a very big issue in this. Uh, I would say also schools or institutional autonomy as well is a big issue. Uh, uh, we talk as if we should do this and so on, but there's always a question of who should do what. Uh, another one that just came up in passing, but I want to highlight is the role of language. And uh, uh, since we talked a lot about uh, gaps, differences, we talked about, uh, you know, one thing that came up, I think, in all the presentations in some way or the other was the fact that the problem that we are talking about is an age old problem, what has always been a problem, namely individualized learning, right? And especially in mathematics, we have uh, had this problem of uh, students at any level, whether you're talking about uh, from UKG to PhD, I mean, uh, classroom always has uh, uh, very, very different kinds of mathematicians sitting in front of you. And, uh, but uh, math curriculum, math pedagogy as a rule, uh, uh, finds it very hard to grapple with this. Now you're going to say, when you say that the differences are exacerbated, you know, the gaps are widened, and we are now talking about children who have had no access to online at all, online education at all, to those who have, uh, you know, who, who live almost embedded in various kinds of access to not just technology, but very, very sophisticated tools where they can actually create uh, stuff. So the spectrum is enormous. And then there are these ones in between who have had notionally online education, but what has happened is actually abysmal in terms of reality. So with all this, uh, how, what is our uh, understanding of individualized learning, again, in this context, not as something abstract, but as something very real that we need to address in our classrooms and uh, what is needed. So these are things that, and, and of course, assessments where we are, uh, you know, in the dark night, I must say, and uh, uh, it is always, once again, it has always been that. It is not, uh, you know, the, these uh, problems of assessment are not new, but uh, given the kind of emotional issues involved, uh, given the kind of uh, rate that students have had and what they've, and the economic realities that many have had to, we have not talked about that. It's also true that uh, millions have lost their livelihoods in this uh, one year, and it's their children whom you meet in the classroom. So it's not uh, also that, uh, you know, that's not alien because uh, the problems of uh, uh, 
the household and the family are real for children as well. So in, in many, many ways, uh, when we talk about resumption, the, what we are talking about to summarize are basically problems that we have known, but to deal with in a, with a certain immediacy. And uh, the fact that uh, what I, nobody said I would like to underline is that the country has shown a remarkable lack of imagination. Uh, in the last one and a half years, we have shown that we do not have ideas. We are not able to re reimagine board exams in this situation. We are not able to reimagine assessments during the situation. We are not able to reimagine the classroom. So uh, I think it, on the other hand, when we do look at reality as we go along, if we cannot reimagine the curriculum, assessment, pedagogy, everyday reality, the you know, voices of uh, students, we are going to let our students down in a very big way. So I think uh, I just wanted to foreground many of these things that have come up, and there are even more of these coming up now in chat. Uh, let me open out, but first, before uh, I ask, uh, we have less than half an hour. Uh, first, I would like to ask uh, whether the panelists want to add something in light of what has been said. Uh, Ranjini, would you like to add something? or respond to what, or raise questions for the other panelists. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jan. I just wanted to respond to this question of assessments and the use of uh, technology in the classrooms as, you know, as we reopen. I think, um, see, technology has always been, ever since technology was thought of in school education, it has always been thought of as a spike, right, on to which you send content. and. Uh, the pandemic was just, you know, giving you all the necessary um, justification for continuing to do more of the same. And we really need to look at whether that's the role that technology should play or it could, could do other things as well. But unless we are able to really address the issues of access and access as a meaningful access to children to actually work with technology um, for learning, then my suggestion would be to say, you know, for me, it is like, you know, the rich can have teachers and the poor can have technology. I mean, to put it so bluntly, that's really how it works because it's often seen as this, you know, capsule through which you deliver content and that goes nowhere. So I really think that's not a good way of uh, technology integration at all. Uh, secondly, what really has me buried uh, is this rise of all these um, various uh, you know, learning apps and modules which have assessments built into them, which also tell the children what they have to learn next, which tell the teachers what they should teach next. And so where are we going? So we are taking this whole centralization to a whole new level where it's not even with, it's not even with this notional thing called the school anymore. And that's really not the way um, to go. And uh, it really seems like, you know, there is, we really need to relook at it very, very radically, very differently. And it's not to sort of uh, take the same old content and same old methodology and try to you know, make a video to do the same thing. You know, that's not the way we should be looking at it. So in fact, a short answer to that is we should actually discourage it. If I could actually say it, I would, I would go as far as to say that. And even to say discourage hybrid models of um, schooling, reopening. Uh, in a sense, because in school is about a learning community. So what ends up, what will end up happening um, is that you will privilege some over the others, which is already the case. And we just do more of that um, in that context. So, but uh, I mean, I don't want to keep uh, repeating that, but that's kind of what I would respond to. Thank you. Now, Atmaram, would you like to add anything or raise a question? Yeah, I just want to add one more uh, thing. I have been uh, thinking of uh, this for quite a long time. See, uh, the problem with, with this assessment technique uh, is teachers are not aware of it. Teachers do not know how to prepare assessments, first of all. Uh, so the, why can't we have a sort of question bank where we can give some models of these at least, so that they can be guided properly. How would they be? For example, uh, recently I had an experience. One student asked me, zero to two, 
x into 2 minus x equal to 0 because integral is equal to 0 is uh, because here if there is 0, that x minus 2 is 0. Therefore, everything is 0, sir. Why do you bother about it? So I can do differentiation without knowing what differentiation is. I can integrate without knowing what integration is. This sort of things are going on everywhere from primary level to higher level. So in primary level, I have been telling you also know that the, the one student can do LCM without knowing what LCM at all. So this is this is happening everywhere. So unless this assessment techniques are properly given to teachers and trained well, I think our system is not going to improve much. And we have to tell them how to question properly, where to question properly, when to question. So they do not know all these things. So unless we concentrate more of orientation towards teachers uplift, I think anything will not I mean, be helpful in our efforts. So we have to concentrate only on that. Perhaps associations like us can do something in this regard. Thanks very much. In fact, uh, I think I mentioned it on chat also that we need many, many assessment models accessible to teachers and making such a resource base and making it available is actually a very important task that as you know, math education community that we can take up. Uh, Maya, would you like to add anything or raise a question uh, to the other panelists or in general? Yeah. Uh no, well, I was the last one to speak, so <laughs> I was lucky to have, have heard them before. Uh, and in fact, I repeated a lot of what they said. Uh, okay. Nothing from me. We can, you know, Thank open you. up the discussion or, well, you're the master of ceremony. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, so there have been many, many comments and we have, I think several of us have been uh, responding on chat as well and uh, continuing the discussion. Uh, there is one uh, remark that I wanted to uh, highlight that is about uh, Amber talking about uh, the academic uh, bank of credit uh, that uh, NEP talks about. And uh, UGC has uh, put out this uh, document on blended learning. I don't know how many people have taken a look at it. This is a you know formal recommendation that uh, is coming up. Uh, now, these are things that uh, as a community, I think the math education community has to look at carefully, evaluate and respond to. This is very important because, uh, you know, before you know, it will be reality and we have to uh, deal with uh, these things because after all, it comes from the G UGC as well. Uh, okay, uh, let me uh, open up the discussion in terms of uh, yeah, uh, if you can raise your hand and uh, bring up the issues and we can take that. I don't want to go back to the comments on the chat because uh, there is more, but uh, please feel free to uh, yeah, raise your hand now and uh, bring up your statement or raise any issue. Uh, yes, uh, Ravi. You can unmute yourself, can you? I said ask to unmute, but I don't know if I can. Ah, yeah. yeah, okay. Right. Uh, thanks. I think the I was trying to unmute. <clears throat> no, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, we have a couple of things. One is that uh, we, uh, you, you know, lots of people have pointed out uh, what's wrong and what could possibly be done, uh, etc. in terms of ideas. But I think we also have as an association a responsibility to do something about it. And uh, a responsibility because I think we are precisely in a position to be able to do something which can make a difference. I mean, this is the power of uh, coming together uh, collectively and what we cannot do individually or in our uh, own limited spaces, we should be able to achieve uh, through a forum like, through a platform like this association. 
And so I think we should devote some energy to thinking about what can make a difference. And it's not going to be easy also to identify what precisely needs to be done and to uh, uh, go ahead and actually do it. That's one thing I wanted to say. So I would really urge members to think about uh, carefully about what needs to be done, what should be postponed or need not be given that much importance. Because uh, you, know, you have to be also careful about what you choose to do uh, collectively. That's one comment. The other comment I wanted to say is that about autonomy. Again, uh, uh, I think we, uh, most teachers when they actually teach in the classroom do experience a certain degree of autonomy, even given the, within the constraints that are present, whether it is the syllabus or the time schedules or the examination and the need to prepare for exam, all that, given all that also, they have some limited autonomy. Uh, that can be exercised within the classroom. And I think, again, here, a collective exercise in reflecting on that autonomy, strengthening it, and sharing what is possible within that uh, space will help. So I think the association also provides a platform to exercise what I would call collective autonomy. And this is very important because we are, unfortunately, in a social system which does not give uh, sufficient uh, space to teachers, sufficient decision-making power, which it should, because and that's really uh, one of the, the purposes of this association, I would say. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that is very well said, Ravi. Uh, I think, uh, you know, in fact, uh, I must also say that uh, one of the motivations for having a discussion like this uh, here in the conference was to initiate uh, such an effort. And uh, I mentioned assessment models, I would say pedagogic models, you know, uh, having a resource base and uh, developing a resource base that on the basis of sharing, not on the basis of uh, authentication that the system provides, but in terms of as an association to learn from each other and use this uh, opportunity to network and learn from each other. Uh, anybody else wants to say something? Uh, Ishan Santra, I would like to invite you to make a point because Ishan has been uh, saying many, many interesting things over the last one hour. So, uh, but uh, you know, I would like to invite Ishan Santra to make a point. But uh, let me see where, uh, if you raise your hand, I can try to unmute you. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, hello, uh, Jam. How are you? Very Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> please, please, Ishan. Yeah. yeah so I, I actually didn't uh, want to say anything. I was just like, uh, uh, I okay. wanted to listen to the teachers and everyone. So my, I mean, in one line, what I uh, wanted to wanted us all actually to reflect, and I think uh, Case already mentioned that it's that. Uh, I mean, if we look at assessment, it seems that it's not doing what it what it is supposed to do. Or in a sense, uh, if we look at assessment, saying that uh, assessment is actually doing what it is supposed to do because the larger school system or the larger economy outside is actually uh, kind of uh, like forcing the assessment to do something something else. But as like school professionals or educational researchers, we, uh, I mean, I think we reflect on it to see whether uh, the way we talk about assessment, like it, it is not meeting uh, uh, the expectations uh, related to learning and teaching and all those kind of things. We need to reflect whether at all we can have an assessment inside the school system uh, which can uh, meaningfully track uh, students' learning. Uh, so I, I am skeptical about that because assessment is one place which seems, as you already mentioned, that uh, like quite unchanged throughout the years in school system. Even uh, I already mentioned in one of my comments, even there is one ethnographic research. Uh, so one of the most uh, like progressive uh, policies that we uh, kind of came up with in NCF uh, 2005. So 
so it actually dedicated a one like uh, group paper on examination reformation and all those kind of things and it uh, wanted to have this comprehensive and co uh, cce kind of exams uh, like assessment for learning and all but it uh, it like after like 5 6 years it actually ended up uh, becoming much more like a summative assessment uh, only uh, not like assessment for learning so i think we need to really reflect on this and be pretty skeptical about assessment thanks ishan i i understand the, your skepticism on this but i think it's also important to share create models make it available to teachers make it available to systems as well i think these are all discussions that we need to continue uh, while Shana, there are other points uh, uh, i would like to invite rakhi to uh, talk about something that she mentioned on chat i think that's important and i would like to uh, is rakhi uh, no again this unless there is a hand it's hard to see i think to unmute okay yes rakhi can you please unmute and speak uh, hello uh, actually i was also thinking that perhaps as an association and then sort of organized uh, community uh, we should probably invest little more uh, not little more maybe much more effort also to think about research in mathematics education at various levels because i think one of the difficulties uh, as i see it in this country is that we don't have a shared understanding of what is important to teach so the question that umar and shweta were engaging in the chat about who should do what we do not perhaps understand what is more important is lcm more important or is fractions more important is uh, factorization more important what is important how must you one how must one uh, do this thing so that in times of this as well as in the normal periods perhaps we are able to figure out uh, what must be done with students so that mathematics becomes meaningful for them uh, and this should not only be restricted of course i'm not talking only about pedagogy but about structures about processes about institutional mechanisms about scaling things what we lack perhaps we do have uh, small models here and there dispersed in this country we do not have models of scaling these up so uh, i think we need to invest some sincere effort and time to uh, think about uh, research research in all aspects and at all levels of mathematics that might help us and support us thank you thank you thank you rakhi uh, ranjini Uh, you were about to say something. Uh, yeah, I was just going to briefly respond to Ishan saying that um, yes, it's very important to have a, a level of skepticism about assessments. But I, what I do want to say is uh, there have been models which have been tried. There are institutions which have actually uh, done assessments very differently. I mean, they've 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 only done it differently. Um, I actually come from having taught in the Krishnamurti Foundation schools, and I've taught. both uh, elementary and high school there and uh, formative assessments are the way assessments are done till the children actually take the school leaving exam it's just that uh, it's an advocacy point really it is uh, curriculum assessments all of these are political and uh, um, like professor subramanian said if we can really use this opportunity or this kind of fora to um, bring home that point and talk about the need to bring about these reforms there are models to draw from i'm not trying to say anything one answer will fit everything that's not at all what i'm trying to say but the problem is not that we don't have things to draw upon it's just that we don't have the will to institutionalize them there are other comments there is a lot of uh, discussion on chat about uh, an urban rural divide and high resource and low resource uh, situations and the contrast 
the fact that uh, you know when it comes to government schools uh, or uh, you know huge population of children who haven't had any access at all to any form of online uh, education during this instruction uh, does anyone want to respond to that I actually wanted to ask Ranjini a follow up question to what she just yeah. said. Yeah. Uh, Ranjini, you just said that, you know, there are uh, sort of uh, systems within which alternative methods of assessment have been tried. So they are available, but to be widely institutionalized, there's a, the will is missing. Uh, why do you think that is? Is it because we really want everybody? <laughs> to come out of school with this one number, which is the average in that school leaving exam. And that's very convenient for us to have, and then, you know, use that to filter them out into various uh, slots. Or is it because they're just too labor intensive, these alternatives? Like uh, I've seen in the chat and also uh, in the dis discussions, this uh, idea of projects, who's going to grade those projects? not me, <laughs> you know, that's so labor intensive. Um, I don't know. Why do you think there's this missing bit? Jam, it might be another panel all by itself. <laughs> but, uh, let me just try to very quickly answer that. Uh, um, it's simply, you actually answered it also, Maya. It's just that because we want this one number because of which it becomes easy for everybody to uh, you know, the, you know, you want to be really sure that uh, this number means this across all contexts and across all boards and, and across all kinds of things. And in a sense, quite at odds with the whole idea of affirmative action. But then that's uh, that's another debate altogether. But yes, it is because we really want that one kind of number. And we are also, as a system, we are also not geared to uh, equitable education or education that is actually making people productive at a large scale. We are really teaching to a very small objective and, and you want numbers which will only go towards that particular objective. So there's certainly that reason. Second is yes, they are labor intensive. Uh, that's why these models are done in small settings. Uh, then that's why I said it's a whole new panel because it, it goes to your class sizes. Uh, Arthur Raman has talked about 97 children in a class. You have to have a train the trainer model even for a classroom, right? With 97 kids. So, so therefore, yeah, the these are la very labor intensive. The, the settings have to be done very differently. Um, but you can always borrow some ideas into the classroom. The CCE, for instance, you know, I know many teachers actually told me uh, in Karnataka math teachers that we would have much rather have done a regular summative assessment because what is now happening is I give a summative test every month and I'm calling it formative assessment. How exactly is it formative? And they'll actually be training the children to write that one summative quiz, which they call it formative assessment. It was a big joke, really. So of course, now that got revoked. But so yeah, the answer to the question is we are really not wanting to look at education in that sense. So we want it to be sort of codified to this one number. And that's easy to assess, easy to administer. That's how examinations came up in the first place, right? And and also to some extent, our obsession with uh, measurable outcomes. Uh, yes, we do need to know what children are learning. As teachers, we need to know what we are teaching, what children are learning. But uh, to put it all down to one metric uh, is just that it's just convenient and it is administrative compulsion. So much is going on into that. For instance, in one uh, class, I remember when I taught physics, I would actually tell the children, grade yourself. And I would solve, we'll solve the paper, back, actually we'll solve the paper together in the classroom and the children would grade themselves and turn their graded papers in to me. And very surprisingly, I found that parents had a huge objection to this. They actually came and said, how dare you do this? I said, what's wrong? How do you know what my child is really capable of? You know, I said, I know. Uh, no, no, you, what they meant was that they wanted their child to be graded vis-a-vis -vis others. It's so ingrained, right? So, I mean, it became a huge problem in the school that I taught. And even though I did it with the prior permission of the academic or whatever and all that, they said, you know, you're just shirking your job. I said, no, I'm doing no such thing. But uh, then children were, in fact, very, they responded to it very differently. They actually said, uh, uh, how do you know that we will not cheat? I said, go ahead. 
you know, go ahead and cheat. But not, not. I, I always did it, and no child ever uh, felt the need. And they actually came back and told me also, why should we? Because we found that it didn't matter to you. And we are not concerned. It didn't matter to you, and we didn't, we didn't really feel the need. So there are multiple compulsions here because even, you know, in I saw a comment about how the rich, affluent parents don't send their children, want to send their children. It's all part of a much larger um, co-opting of this whole process of education by the affluent and the elites and so on. Like it, so it's a different panel altogether. So I'll stop with that. So there are multiple threads to that problem. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, that's a good uh, signature tune, Ranjani. And now we can and here. <laughs> yeah. So uh, since we are almost at the end, I would like to ask the panelists whether they have any sharp one minute comments. Uh, I think Ranjani has had hers now. So I'm going to ask Maya, would you, do you have any last uh, comment to offer or can you wind up? Um, yeah, sure. Just in response to what Ranjani was saying, I love that story about, you know, uh, getting the children to assess themselves. And it worked for you and it worked for the children. And uh, uh, why should it work for anybody else? <laughs> you know, uh, but I mean, I was just thinking about when uh, Ashoka was starting and we were trying to decide on what basis we're going to, you know, what is our admission criteria? And the SAT is one of the exams that we do accept. Uh, and we like it because, you know, it's, it's uniform and, but it's not necessary and it's also an expensive exam but for any of these different boards or the SAT or any of these exams which have different ways of like turning out an evaluation its predictive power is actually very weak I mean the SAT for example predicts how well a student will do at the end of college yes sorry I should stop talking but um, you know if you didn't have that what would you do? How would you sit through those thousands and thousands of applicants and say, okay, we're admitting these 800? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I don't know is a good concluding sentence, I think. That's okay. Yeah, there's a lot we don't know. <laughs> yes. Uh, Alparaman, sir, do you have any last uh, comment to offer? Uh, nothing more to add what, <laughs> what I was saying. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, uh, once again, I think, uh, let me conclude with uh, saying that uh, what Ravi actually mentioned is that uh, associations like this have uh, uh, a role that could, if nothing else, uh, network people, network the teaching community, thinking about these issues, articulating many of their concerns. I think articulating our concerns and uh, look at what we agree on and what we differ in is already a very important thing in uh, professional terms and also uh, developing resource bases uh, models that we can share and uh, find an active medium for sharing i think this is also very important uh, i hope this uh, discussion uh, in this conference provides us an opportunity to initiate uh, uh, steps in these direction. I thank you all for uh, coming and uh, participating in this discussion. Uh, I thank the panelists for uh, uh, presenting very important perspectives that uh, we can all learn from. And I thank all of you for coming. Thank you very much. Over to Haritha and Amber. Hello. Uh, yes, Haritha, we can hear you. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so, yeah, we are now proceeding to the final uh, program of the conference. I thank all the panelists for uh, giving their insights on uh, the topic. And we will meet uh, on the different uh, link now for the cultural program. Okay, so see you in just two minutes there. Rita, can you save the chat? Yeah, sure, I'll do that. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Somebody was asking about feedback. Yeah, yeah. I 
आई एम गोइंग टू सेंड यू समथिंग 